Welcome to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, the show that delves into the ups and downs of the stock market, changes in the economy, and news from the worlds of real estate and technology. From breaking news on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or the overseas market, to updates on the bond market, if there's money to be made, we've got you covered. I'm your host, Paula DuPont, and today we're going to be talking about that period of time called After Corona, or AC. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about some observations from the swine flu that occurred back several years ago, what were some of the things that changed as a result of that, and how that relates to uh, the coronavirus and what we might expect from that. We're going to talk about some of the things that governors in different states are doing to look at reopening uh, their states. Uh, We're going to talk about the business world and what they're doing in order to uh, return back to whatever normal is or the new normal. And then we're going to talk about um, a couple of things that both states and businesses are are looking to that uh, will be a critical element and they're restarting. One of them is talking about GPS tracking or some way to show that people have, um, they're cleared from the virus in order to be back and socialized. Uh, And we're going to talk about uh, one of those uh, technologies that's being explored. And then we're going to talk about the vaccines and where we are with the development of a coronavirus vaccine. Then finally, we're going to talk about what it's going to take for us to have fun again. And I do believe that day is coming. When? Of course, that's the topic of the whole show is when. But um want to consider some things for all of us in uh, when that day does come and what we're going to do. So we'll get started in just a moment. As I said, some years ago, uh, some of you may recall, we had another epidemic, which was called the H1N1 virus. It was something that was likened to the flu, or it was a a, a kind of flu, and some people called it the swine flu, because originally it had to do with contact with pigs. Interestingly, with that virus that went around in in the 2009-2010 time frame, uh, the uh, young people in across the world had less of an immunity to it. And I kind of conversely to today's coronavirus, where uh, younger people have uh, less likelihood to develop it. And in with the swine flu, about a third of people aged 60 and over actually carried antibodies to it, whether or not they had suffered any symptoms of the swine flu. So they were already uh, immune to it. So just to give you an idea of the impact, and I didn't really realize that till I I went back and looked at some statistics and I went to the Center for Disease Control to see what some of those uh, statistics were. But evidently, 60.8 million cases, 60.8 million people had contracted the swine flu. And of that amount, about 12,500 people actually died from it. And uh, in terms of, of, uh, again, another perspective about the difference with that flu and the virus currently that we're dealing with is that 80% of the deaths of the swine flu were to people 65 years and younger. So kind of a different population being affected. But my experience with the swine flu was it was something that uh, as as someone who worked in a corporation, 
I was part of a response team and looking at how we would prepare for it, how we would uh, prepare the workforce and help to keep them safe and make sure that uh, critical workers were still going to be available and that they were protected. So I was involved in a lot of the behind the scenes preparing for the impact of the virus, but in actuality, it hadn't hit our workplace and it hadn't hit, um, you know, as widespread uh, as it has, as the coronavirus has. And in fact, um, for the, when the uh, flu had dissipated in the workplace and we had already prepared for its possible impact, one of the things that we did was put uh, hand sanitizer units throughout the company. We also had uh, the little uh, the little bottles that everyone carried around, and they had the company's logo on it. And what's what's kind of interesting in terms of before and after, those hand sanitizer units stayed up. It was just now a regular fixture in the environment, as was you know those little bottles with of personal hand sanitizer. We still had them in our drawers and gym bags and wherever else you, you keep them. So even though it never really surfaced in the workplace where I was, awareness had. And for most people before that, there was little awareness of the threat and not a lot of discussion afterwards. We didn't have the war stories or the people that we knew who had been impacted by it like today we will probably have those stories to tell when this is over, whenever over is, that is. So in looking at where we were then afterwards and where we will be in the next couple of months, I think definitely the world perspective will now be divided by BC and AC, before Corona, after Corona. Right now we're DC, during Corona. This has become the new defining moment in a world that was previously defined as post 9-11. So here are a couple of observations or, or thoughts that I have about that. I think that when employees first go back into the workplace, it will definitely be awkward. I imagine them looking like characters in a disaster movie or post-apocalyptic movie where they come out of hiding, they're moving slowly, afraid to touch anything, their heads are low but their eyes are looking up and they're really wide. And they're, they're looking for danger as they move slowly. But then I think, you know, after the first day or so, people will roll up their sleeves and they'll start getting to work. But the questions come out. What, what's changing? What changed in the workplace? How do I feel safe in this workplace? I think that after Corona, managers may rethink the crowded employee gatherings and events and town hall meetings that they have. They may even rethink the teaming rooms. Those are those uh, kind of a, a newer concept of uh, rooms set up just for teams to work in. They might want to rethink that. Companies will need to define what the right physical distance is between employees. And I'm sure it's going to vary from one place to another. Human resources. They will be busy revising the playbook that considers future scenarios of protecting employees while at the same time protecting their their privacy. And what about travel, business travel, and training for that matter, the things that would have employees leaving the office? Well, we've now seen the value of video conferencing. Of course, many businesses saw that value before, but it's really stepped up now uh, with a lot more companies using it to take the place of what would be in-person meetings, whether they're uh, across the country or... Uh, locally, uh, you know, now we have that, that opportunity. So these are just a couple of the considerations that I think will be considered for the workplace. Of course, there are many, many others when you consider all the different types of workplaces and businesses there are out there and things that I couldn't possibly cover all here. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that later in the podcast about what some businesses are looking at in order to reopen, what they're what they will look like going forward. So stay tuned. As part of that break, I want to talk to you about Birch Gold Group. In 2008, the U.S. national debt was $10 trillion. 
Today, it's over $23 trillion, and it's rising like a hockey stick. If you don't think we're sitting on a house of cards, you're living with your head in the sand. But since you're listening to this podcast, you're clearly smarter than the average American. So what's your plan? Can you afford another hit to your retirement like the last downturn when the S&P dropped 50%? As one of the top dealers of physical precious metals in the United States, Birch Gold Group helps Americans diversify their savings with gold and silver. Customers can purchase for physical possession or convert a portion of their IRA or 401k into an IRA backed by physical precious metals. Birch Gold Group specializes in gold IRAs. Gold is a safe haven against uncertainty. You can hedge against inflation and hedge against uncertainty and instability with precious metals. Right now, thanks to a little-known IRS tax law, you can even move your IRA or eligible 401k into an IRA backed by physical gold and silver. It's perfect for those who want to protect their hard-earned retirement savings from any future geopolitical uncertainty. Look back historically. When the bottom falls out of everything else, gold tends to safeguard savings. Birch Gold Group has thousands of satisfied customers, countless five-star reviews, and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Contact Birch Gold Group to request a free info kit on physical precious metals. See if diversifying into gold and silver makes sense for you. This comprehensive 20-page kit reveals how gold and silver can protect your savings and how you can legally move your IRA or 401k out of risky stocks and bonds and into a precious metal IRA. To get your no-cost, no-obligation co- kit, go to birchgold.com slash finance. That's B-I-R-C-H gold.com slash finance. Are you a business owner? Someone interested in the latest news that might affect your business? Then check out the GSMC Business News Podcast, a show dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning business, technology, and the stock market. Get a head start on the day as we keep you updated on the latest goings on on Wall Street, money, jobs, and technology. The GSMC Business News Podcast has you covered. Figures from Johns Hopkins University, there are roughly about 572,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus in this country. That is as of, uh, I believe, Monday morning statistics. Last Friday, we hit a peak of over 35,000 new reported cases. The average number of new cases has steadily grown to about 31,000 a day. However, Since then, new cases are starting to decline, or the number of new cases are starting to decline. Sunday's new cases were below 29,000. So we went from an average of about 31,000 a day of new new cases to under 29,000. Perhaps at the time that you're listening to this, the numbers will be different. But that at least gives us a little glimmer of hope that possibly we're starting to flatten the curve a little bit. I think there's a recognition by many experts and hopeful uh, business people and others who are hoping that this signals the beginning of the flattening of the curve. And of course, it's going to be a while before we're at the bottom of that curve and we're feeling safer and better about going back to life after Corona. Right now, there's a little bit of saber rattling between the federal government and the state governments about who calls it, who decides when it's safe to reopen businesses and government offices and for people to start social activity again. Well, we won't get into whether or not it is the president's or governor's, uh, the, the president or the governor's who should be calling the shots. But we will look at what some of the governors across the country have been doing in order to um, look at when we would reopen. 
the governors of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Rhode Island said they were creating a working group of public health, economic, and government officials from each state to develop a regional plan. The group's members will soon get to work, but they haven't set a timeline for when they plan to reopen their economies. Across the country, the governors of California, Oregon, and Washington agreed that they would jointly reopen their economies based on certain health outcomes. And uh, that it does seem to be a resounding theme um, among many, both in, at the government level and also with businesses, as looking at the health outcomes and how we're going to measure that. California's Governor Gavin Newsom said that his staff would release a more detailed state-specific approach to reopen the economy there. In New York City, which makes up the bulk of the known corona cases, Mayor Bill de Blasio said that robust testing capabilities would be needed to better track transmission rates and to make more informed decisions on when and how to reopen businesses, schools, and places of work. Governors out west said the states would need an effective system for testing, tracking, and isolating. One of the considerations for governments in looking to reopen the economies in their states is tempering that hope that they have for the flattening of the curve and the decline of the new cases of the virus, tempering that with the reality that other governments elsewhere where they had seen a decline in the outbreak and reopened business only to face a second and third wave of infections due to the coronavirus. Another challenge that the states and uh, even the federal government have is in looking at the reliability of data, particularly if they're looking for uh, setting marks in health outcomes, as in the number of um, positive cases of coronavirus and uh, other data that would come from tests being done. One of the issues is there aren't enough tests, there aren't enough people being tested, so there isn't a really uh, valid sense of just how much impact the coronavirus is having because, of course, there are many out there who may be symptom-free and have not been tested. And so that is at issue, along with the fact that uh, there are false negatives in testing, and there's also a difference in how um, numbers are reported about the testing. So that combination of factors about the reliability of the data does make it a little bit difficult to come up with uh, one foundation for health outcomes. I mentioned earlier in this segment that there is a uh, somewhat of a, a little battle or behind the scenes battle going on right now between whether or not the president is the one to determine when we will reopen the economy or whether it's the states. And so far it's it's been the states that have had the authority to um, issue the stay at home orders and the mandates uh, and to close schools and um, they have been doing that. And at the same time, there have been calls for the federal government to order states that have not initiated a stay-at-home order to do so. And there has been uh, some pushback on that because of the states versus federal role. So uh, going forward, we know that both levels of government are working on this and are looking at this with both being anxious to be able to restart the economy, get people back to work, get people back to spending, get people back to socializing. So we know that there there has been uh, that effort going on from both the president and the council that he's picking to, to inform when the right time is and how it's going to be done. I think most agree that it will be a phased approach that it won't happen all at once, at least from a state level, that um, many of the of the uh, loosening of 
the mandates to stay in place will come off gradually. And of course, businesses are going to be looking to the states and and possibly also the the uh, president's orders to inform how they will return to business, both to protect the safety of their employees and their customers and uh, what measures that they're going to need to put in place to protect them going forward. So we're going to talk a little bit more in the next segment about what businesses are looking at in terms of preparing for coming back to work, what they're going to do to help people feel safe and comfortable and want to come to their establishments. So we're going to talk about that more in a moment after this commercial. Do you work in the world of marketing and advertising? Are you a media buyer or the owner of an agency? Have you been looking for a podcast to help stay on top of all the goings on of those worlds? The GSMC Marketing News Podcast is dedicated to keeping you up to date on all things concerning marketing and advertising. Get the latest marketing news from what major businesses have planned for the coming year to the newest trends in advertising from podcasts, digital and streaming to the old standbys of radio, television and billboards. The GSMC Marketing News Podcast has you covered, whether you're a marketing agent or a business trying to expand your brand. Okay, we're back. Companies are doing the same thing as governments are doing in assembling their experts and looking at best practices from elsewhere, particularly companies that have counterparts in China where they have reopened business. The Wall Street Journal took a look at a wide range of businesses and what they are doing. There are some common themes that are emerging that businesses are looking at, similarly to the, what the government's looking at. Things like having frequent temperature checks of employees to see if they may show signs of the coronavirus. Increased monitoring of employees in general and customers for that matter. Uh, potentially even blood tests to determine whether workers have uh, like. And of course, a common theme heard by many is that uh, we can't really expect for operations to return to normal until there is a vaccine that's widely available. So that is uh, something we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, later on in the podcast. Another common theme is that of capacity and companies defining what kind of uh, proximity employees and customers and others will have with each other back when um, operations continue or business opens. And uh, what we're seeing is that uh, restaurants, movie theaters, other entertainment venues are already looking at limiting the capacity and in the number of people that they will allow in their establishment at any given time. And I think that's not only uh, a safety measure that's being looked at, but also a confidence measure for the employees and for um, guests or members that would come into an establishment, giving them some sense of assuredness that they're not going to be among a lot of people. I guess the big question there is, what is that reasonable distance? What is the right amount of capacity for a venue? It will be interesting to see whether or not... um, market research or uh, having um, the uh, customers or employees themselves give feedback as to what they would feel comfortable about in terms of uh, social distancing. So we'll see how that evolves. Another factor that's coming into the fore is GPS tracking. I mean, right now we have have smartphones 
and ways that uh, we could be tracked. We could find out perhaps where there are hot spots where we might encounter coronavirus infection. Theoretically, that is. However, there there are some efforts being made to look at that data, and uh, we're going to talk about that in one of the upcoming segments. But right now, the U.S. federal government has yet to launch a national test and trace strategy, and that, of course, would be founded in using personal devices in some way to be able to to track people and to track the virus. Um you know, there's, of course, a lot of issues with whether or not the government should be doing that. Um, however, that is something that businesses uh, would probably find useful in um, helping to protect their employees and their customers. Um, many other countries are using some sort of GPS or tracking system. In Iceland, for example, one-third of the Icelandic population has already downloaded a new government-approved app that uses GPS to track users who can give contact tracing officials access to their data if they tested positive for the virus. China was able to come out of the lockdown thanks to its own tracking system and its way to find and quarantine the affected. Although uh, this is something that likely wouldn't happen in um, our democracy um, because of the way in which they are able to enforce this type of use. Dozens of companies have notified the U.S. Food and Drug Administration that they are developing tests that indicate whether someone has had and is likely immune to the coronavirus though some early efforts have hit roadblocks in other countries. As I mentioned before, temperature checking has factored in to a number of companies' approaches to uh, managing the coronavirus. Uh, Major airlines are discussing the feasibility of having passengers submit to temperature checks before boarding flights. Now, again, they're just exploring that. It isn't yet clear whether airlines or airport security would shoulder that task. Two weeks ago, American Airlines Group Incorporated began asking frequent flyers and top corporate customers what it might take to get them to be comfortable with flying again. Their answer, clean planes. Because of that, American Airlines has been disinfecting cabins more often, among other measures, and is making sure that customers do know that that's what they're doing. American is also looking at how it can limit contact in the boarding process and uh, in the flight. Passengers might grab their own beverages and snacks as they board the plane uh, through the bridge on short flights. When American asked their customers what they thought uh, the time frame would be for when the crisis will abate and when they feel that things will be back to normal, and largely the response was that it would be between three and six months. Interestingly, about half of the customers that were surveyed said that they'd consider flying again about six weeks after the virus dissipates. Again, I guess that's the big question is, when can we say that the virus has dissipated? Still, I thought that uh, sounded like a pretty good confidence factor there. Another industry, when you look at manufacturing, um, is taking a different approach to how it's going to be set up. Manufacturers have redrawn factory floor plans and implemented new processes, such as staggering shift workers or asking employees to take turns eating lunch in their cars to avoid cafeteria crowding, practices that may become standard as more plants come back online. Tyson, which is the biggest U.S. meat company by sales, is actually installing walk-through temperature scanners at its plants across the country and sending home workers that show potential for COVID-19 symptoms. Toyota, which during the crisis has um, converted their manufacturing plants to produce personal protective equipment, is also testing protocols 
for on-site health screenings for workers, especially those who were involved in the medical supply production, and looking at, looking at how they can widen that approach once the company restarts auto manufacturing again. In a completely different industry of professional sports, Major League Baseball is actually exploring the idea of staging some form of a season by setting up a biodome or closed ecological system in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And then what they would do is sequester players in that area and they would hold games at the Arizona Diamondbacks Chase Field in downtown Phoenix and also at nearby spring training facilities and on fields at local universities. This is just one of the plans that they are considering, um, among others, and, and many that have been uh, speculated about so far in order to salvage some form of the MLB season. Starbucks has been looking to its uh, Chinese counterparts uh, to see how they've gone about reopening their cafes. And 95% of the company's China stores are now open with limited hours and reduced seating. That is something that they're looking to do back here in the United States as well. And a similar approach is being looked at by other national chains like uh, Texas Roadhouse, for instance, um, that's looking at staggered seating and reducing capacity. Well, it's time for another quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the new Apple and Google partnership and what they're doing in terms of uh, looking to track uh, coronavirus. Be back in a minute. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. We're back. And so this whole podcast has been focused on life after Corona, that that dream that we see hopefully in the not too distant future. We know it's coming and we know we have to prepare because it's not going to be just a quick return to business as usual, life as usual. We looked at what governments are doing, what businesses are doing. And um, exploring, you know, what are some of the common elements that would help to define when the timing will be right, what's the appropriate amount of social distancing, uh, what kind of interfaces that uh, people will have, customers will have uh, when they go back into the workplace or into uh, an establishment, an entertainment or, or a restaurant establishment. One of the things that has come up uh, in, in the media and in discussions about going forward and when will we know the right time to move forward and restart business and life as usual, one of the common things that we've heard and read is that tracking will play a key role. Tracking in some form, whether it's electronically or some other means of um 
employers and businesses to know uh, who has been exposed to the virus, who carries an immunity, and basically to know what the existing threats are and to be able to isolate that. Tracking, as we know, is an inherent privacy individual and a rights issue for individuals. And, um, you know, where before when we mentioned how businesses and governments are um, looking at, you know, getting ready to come back and how Iceland is one of the, the countries where um, a third of the population has downloaded an app that helps to track that. And, uh, you know, if it is something that's voluntary, that's great. But, you know, I guess the issue is if not everybody is using it, if there isn't some sort of consistency with it, will it really have real value uh, to us? Well, some big news came out late last week, and that is that tech giants Apple and Google actually are partnering to work on a tracking app, a new collaboration that will use Bluetooth technology on phones could allow users who opt in to tap into an ecosystem of apps from health authorities that track the coronavirus. Apple and Google together will build the software that would alert people if they were in contact with someone infected with the coronavirus, an unprecedented collaboration between the two tech giants, and in fact, rivals. The project is certain to raise privacy concerns, but offers the most concrete technological solution to date for governmental authorities searching for ways to lift, at least partially, lockdown orders that have swept across the nation. The companies are by far the world's biggest smartphone software providers with billions of users worldwide. The companies said jointly last week that the contact tracing tools would be built into smartphones using the existing Bluetooth technology that tracks whether phones have passed within a certain distance of each other. The concept, used in some Asian countries earlier this year, could make it easier to contain future outbreaks as people return to daily life. Apple and Google, which is a unit of Alphabet Inc., said privacy and security would be central to the design. The company said they would openly publish information about their work, making it available for researchers to analyze. The first versions of the software will be available next month. The Bluetooth that it actually uses is Bluetooth Low Energy, or Bluetooth LE, which is a radio technology, and it is the core of the system. It is a low-powered alternative to standard Bluetooth technology and has a focus on shorter bursts of connectivity that use less power than a traditional constantly transmitting Bluetooth connection. Uh, in something that I read recently, it said a good illustration of the difference is in how Apple's AirPods work. A short burst Bluetooth LE connection is used to prompt the initial connect and pairing of the headphones before switching over to regular Bluetooth for streaming the music you want to listen to. The choice for Bluetooth LE for the contact tracing system is interesting for a couple of reasons. On the surface, there's a lot about Bluetooth LE that makes it ideal for this sort of application because it's supported by nearly every single smartphone on the market, um, but also that it is very flexible in its specifications, one that works with extremely low power levels so as not to impact battery life. Bluetooth LE its proximity profile is the core technology that Bluetooth relies on for device locating and tracking purposes. By measuring how much is received from a Bluetooth radio signal, we can estimate how far away it is. It's uh, how AirPods know to pop up the would you like to connect dialog on your phone that's nearby and not your roommate's phone across the room. 
According to an article on The Verge on April 14th, Bluetooth also, at least on paper, offers a better solution than QR codes, which have already been used in countries like South Korea, since Bluetooth works at a farther range than the optical scanners needed for QR or barcode technology. Given that distancing is still a key part of preventing the spread of the virus, technology that doesn't require users to get close to patients or their phones is a plus. So there are other companies that have tracking apps, um, many of them from non-governmental organizations. However, they will be uh, not part of the Google and Apple program. Uh, one of the uh, a Google spokesperson said that the tracking data should be restricted to organizations that are legally allowed to practice public health. This spokesperson also said that third-party apps have struggled to do much good because they can't bridge device types or operating systems. Of course, the virus recognizes no such barriers, so the third-party apps fail to track a large enough pool of people to prevent the disease from moving through a population. So very interesting new technology that's being looked at uh, and we'll see whether or not it's going to become a critical player in this and in uh, economies reopening. So we're gonna take another quick break and when we come back, we're gonna talk about yet another facet of this whole equation of coming back to work and that is the vaccine development. So more on that in just a moment. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Hi, we're back. And uh, again, in discussing all the different factors to be considered in reopening business, reopening government, starting life again um, outside of our four walls, one of those elements is the vaccine development. And um, of course, if we can all just get a vaccine for it going forward, we can shut this thing down pretty darn quickly. But you've probably heard, as I have, that it takes at least 12 to 18 months from the point the process begins uh, researching this kind of vaccine because of the tests that have to be done and uh, all the studies that have to, to take place in addition to getting approvals from the FDA and other agencies. One of the companies, one of the big companies that is researching a vaccine is Johnson & Johnson. They are aiming to produce between 600 million and 900 million doses of its potential coronavirus vaccine by the end of the first quarter of 2021, depending on if human trials that it is doing will begin in September as they are planning to do. Johnson & Johnson plans to make 1 billion doses or more annually. And uh, this was recently revealed in a post-earnings conference call with shareholders. Those comments came shortly after the drug maker raised its quarterly dividend and reported first quarter financial results that beat Wall Street's expectations. The company also lowered its 2020 adjusted earnings forecast due to the coronavirus outbreak. It's now expecting a range of 
$7.50 to $7.90 per share from its prior estimate to, of $8.95 to $9.10 per share. Late last month, the company said human testing of its experimental vaccine for the coronavirus will begin by September and could be available for emergency use authorization in early 2021. As I said, uh, Johnson & Johnson is just one of many companies that are looking to uh, make this vaccine. Johnson & Johnson, like other pharmaceuticals, has shifted focus away from the ongoing research and development of other drugs and vaccines to focus on the coronavirus vaccine. There are estimated to be 70 vaccines in development around the world, and three of them are in human trials right now. And that is, of course, one of the essential steps in being able to make the vaccine uh, widely available is uh, a series of human trials, which, of course, comes after a lot of other trials and tests that need to be done before that. In this country, the FDA, the Federal, excuse me, the Food and Drug Administration, and the National Institutes of Health are both um, authorities that have very strict rules around um, releasing new drugs and vaccines. However, in this time, because of the urgency and need for these vaccines, they are said to be really cutting the red tape for approvals in order to expedite getting this out to the population. Um, of course, you know, the, the key standards for safety are being upheld, but, uh, you know, what would normally take years in development, uh, we know that we can't wait that long. In fact, even uh, first quarter April, excuse me, first quarter 2021 sounds a little late in the game too, but... I think that's the best that can be expected at this point. Recently, 60 Minutes did a program where they talked to leaders from the company Moderna, which is a biotech company in the Boston area. Um, and they are one of the vaccine developers or, or they are working on one. Theirs uses a different approach than I guess how other vaccines are being designed or how they would regularly be designed. Moderna has not ever produced a vaccine before, so this is kind of a first. But still, they expect that they will be in human trials by the end of the year. And at the same time, while they're working as fast as they possibly can to do this, you know, within the regulations and guidelines that they're supposed to work, um, they are already looking at how they can uh, ramp up to be able to produce this in mass quantities should it prove effective. So that's just, you know, another another company that's involved in this. As I said, there are at least 70 altogether that are working on this vaccine. So hopefully one of them will, will get it soon. Another development that's been in the news regarding the vaccine, and I guess shouldn't be maybe buried here because it could end up being more of an issue uh, than we like to think, but in India, one of the countries that's more recently been impacted by the coronavirus, they're actually reporting a um, mutation strain uh, with the coronavirus there. Now, this mutation could mean that current vaccine development uh, will not be as impactful because, of course, you're talking about, you know, a whole new approach to it because of this strain. So it's just something that we're going to have to keep an eye on and hopefully won't defeat all the efforts that have been made so far. And one other thing about the development of the vaccines and uh, don't don't be mad at me for bringing this up. This is something that seems to happen uh, from time to time. We have conspiracy theories uh, about vaccines and about the coronavirus. And I'm sure I'm not the first to talk about that. 
But in fact, um, there was an article recently that talked about how there are some anti-vaxxers that are claiming that the coronavirus was developed in a lab somewhere in order to pressure people to accept vaccines and to have widespread vaccines, that this is somehow aimed at the anti-vaxxers and an attempt to uh, make vaccines more acceptable. Some of those who think that the coronavirus is uh, a conspiracy to uh, push vaccines on the rest of us, um, thats they've been using social media to uh, talk about it. Some who believe that the coronavirus is a conspiracy um, have latched on to uh, an idea that went out that circulated years ago uh, about how the measles, mumps, rubella shots vaccines actually caused autism. And there was a report that was posted on the internet about that and it got a lot of people stirred up and created this whole movement. Actually, it may not have created the movement. There, there probably were anti-vaxxers before that, but certainly many latched on to that as one of the reasons why um, they feel they shouldn't have to get a vaccine. Um, that report, by the way, uh, has been taken down and is no longer uh, supported uh by those who uh, put it out there in the first place. So, um, I guess another little, uh, well, maybe not so little obstacle that there could be in um, getting the vaccine out once it is available and making sure that it's um, it's available to everyone. And um, it's it's a kind of thing where if only a few get it, it's not really going to be effective. The whole effectiveness is based on it being widely used so that we're all protected. Much the same way we are with any vaccine for any other illness is it protects um, society as well as uh, the individual. So that's as close as I'll get to politicizing (laughs) about that. So anyway, we're going to take another commercial break. And when we come back, I promise we're going to have something a little lighter to talk about. I mean, it's still related to this whole thing about when we reopen business and society to get back out in it. Um, but this time we're going to talk about it in terms of fun. You remember that that particular F word. Um, if you don't, we're going to talk about it and we're going to get you there. All right, so we'll be back in a minute. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Hi, we're back. And as I promised, we're going to talk about something a little lighter. So my question to you is, and we're going to do a live poll right now, is so when will we have fun again? So what is the first thing you want to do when you're able to leave the house and socialize? So I want you to use your keypad, your keyboard, And I want you to choose from the following multiple choice answers. A, the gym. B, a restaurant. C, the movies. D, the mall 
or stores. Or E, you're going to pay an unfriendly visit to the person who's been posting those Corona themes on Facebook every 10 minutes and the very lame TikTok videos. I mean, they are really getting out of hand. So I'm just going to wait for a second for your results. Do, 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 do. Okay, you get the point. So, um, wow, 50% of you voted yes. So, um, okay, lame. <laughs> so, I have another question for you. What would it take for you to feel comfortable doing that, going out to the venue that you just picked? A, Everyone wears hazmat suits. B, you have a six-foot cane you can use to swat people away from your personal space. C, drive through everything. D, face masks forever and Purell on a lanyard that you wear around your neck. So uh, the results of that survey are in. I'm not going to do the Jeopardy theme anymore, but um, the results of that are in. And 90% of you want a combination of all of these. So seriously, uh, you know, it's too bad we can't actually do a poll because it would be interesting to hear what everybody thinks um, would be the first place that they would go, the first thing that they would do. And if you're like me, it's something that you contemplate from time to time it's in the little thought bubble above your head. You're trying to figure out, you know, what's the first thing you want to do. And I probably should have had on that list going to the hair salon. Um, for some people, that might be the nail salon or other places like that to kind of, um, ooh, spa. That would be a good one. Getting a massage, working out all that stress and the tension and the fear that came with living through this. Um, the point is we are going to live through it. And we are going to have a day when we will have fun again. And as for that second question about what would make us feel comfortable to go to these places again, well, those are the same things that state governments, the federal government, businesses that they're trying to figure out too, what will make them comfortable and knowing what will make us comfortable and safe. Of course, that's, that's the big driver for all of this is safety. We do know that it will be different. Just like watching TV is awkward right now when you see scenes that were obviously recorded before the coronavirus, um, scenes where you have a talk show host giving the virtual or the, uh, the close Hollywood kind of kiss to one of the guests, the hugs, the people sitting close to each other in studio audiences, um, or, you know, any any TV scene that you see where people are socially interacting and they're touching each other. And wow, it's, you know, when you sit and watch it in contrast to the world you're living in, it, it does seem awkward. And I think we're going to, we're going to feel that kind of awkwardness as we come out from the caves and into the real world. By now, you probably know that I relate a lot of things to movies or TV or entertainment in some way. And when I think about going into a restaurant and the expectations that I would have and others would have when you go in there and you're ordering and just even taking in the environment. I kind of picture this scene from the comedy skit show Portlandia with Fred Armisen and Carrie Brownstein where they are in a restaurant and they are asking the server a lot of questions about the chicken that's on the menu. And they want to know, you know, where it's from, not only that it's cage free, but, you know, what farm did it come from? How was it treated? And the show goes, the skit goes on with them actually going back to the farm where the chicken came from because they wanted to know the family. They wanted to know the background. So I'm not saying that we're going to all of a sudden, you know, insist on organic food and, and farm raised, uh, you know, food and vegetables. But I think we're going to ask questions and we're going to no want to know that whatever we're ordering and the environment that we're having it in, that it's safe, right? So um, anyway, and it helps me to think of things in terms of comedy. So that's just one of the things that I think about. 
Another thing I think about is going to the movies. That's something that I really miss. And I'm thinking, you know, those days of sharing a big bucket of popcorn or sharing your candy, it's over. I mean, you're going to have to get your own tub now. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not going to get a tub. I still may do that. But, um, you know, get your own. And if I have to put butter on it myself, oh, please, there better be gloves. What can I say? Travel. Um, what's it going to take to get us to travel anywhere, to go on vacation? Maybe we can get something like those, um, those mosquito masks where that are attached to a pith helmet that you put on your head and somehow the screening on there can actually screen out viruses. You know, if we had suits like that, maybe we could be protected. I don't know. In terms of the gym, uh, when I've asked some people what they want to do, people in my own household, what's the first thing they want to do? Gym. Gym, that's the big thing that comes up because unless you have a setup in your house, it's just something that's hard to substitute for. I mean, obviously you can take a walk or a run, get a little cardio while social distancing, but uh, weights and some of the other equipment, you know, there's just really no substitute unless you have your own gym. And, you know, in terms of feeling comfortable there, well, I've never really felt comfortable at the gym. <laughs> it's something that, you know, you have to do. And I think especially now with, you know, going to a gym and having the very visible effects of being shut in with coronavirus and corona snacks, um, it's not a place I want to be. The only thing is, is that that's probably how everybody else is going to be feeling too. In fact, I'm really kind of looking forward to seeing what some of the gym rats look like since they have uh, haven't had their addiction now at least 30 days and it may be more by the time this is over and they go back. But it um, kind of makes me wonder, are they going to go in the middle of the night, you know, places like Planet Fitness that are open 24 hours? Are they going to go in there, you know, when no one else is around? Um, I hope I don't have to set my alarm to do that just to see them. But uh, in any case, it will be interesting. Um, I know that, you know, the bottom line is it, it's going to be awkward for a while as we transition back to life in the new normal. But usually that awkwardness doesn't last forever. It will just, it will just be for a while and it will be a gradual thing where we will adjust to this new reality that we are living in and you know where as I said earlier in this podcast I talked about uh, my experience after the swine flu had had come through back almost 10 years ago um, I think about what what we were left behind with that and that was you know lots of hand sanitizer being available I think this will be a little different I think this one's really going to leave a mark but again, I think, um, you know, we're going to help to define what we're going to still hold on to, uh, regardless of what states and governments uh, and businesses say. We as individuals will know what's going to make us comfortable and if we're going to change our own habits uh, to um, adjust to this new order. So I want you to think about the positive things. I want you to make your own little list of where you're going to go and what you're going to do when this is over. It's something that at the very least will give you a little hope, a little something to look forward to. So until the next time, I hope that you're all well, you stay healthy, you stay safe, you stay home, and uh, we'll talk again. You've been listening to the GSMC Financial News Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type GSMC into your favorite podcast app to find all of the shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, from business news to weird news. Please subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed today's podcast.